Hi, family. How are you doing? You know, I'm tired. I'm trying to get ready for Africa. Then my computer broke and my incredibly wonderful brother fixed it this afternoon. Oh, thank God for brothers. Hey. It's lovely to be here. I can't wait for November the 8th when I officially join your family. And I shall spend, as I, I shall get around all of you and make friends. Be patient with me. I want to share a little bit of my story tonight. Over the last two years, how I ended up here. And you're all rejoicing, aren't you, that I'm here? Of course you are. Thank you, Lord. I want to read a few verses from Psalm 27, first of all, which is just, hey, it's all the phenomenal living word of God, but I love Psalm 27. It says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid. I'm just going to read little bits of it because otherwise we're going to run out of time this evening. Let me just go right to the end and then perhaps maybe at home sometimes you could you could grab this this psalm. It's awesome. Verse 13 says, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. I believe tonight, as I share a little bit of my two-year tale, that God would like you to make a response that would cause him to take you on a straighter path than perhaps you have recently been on. Because some of you have felt like you've been going around in circles. It's partly why we're rejoicing for what God is doing in Emily. Because the going round in circles it's finished. We're on a straight road of healing for her. And it's awesome. Two years ago, I had a really difficult year. Well, actually, it goes back to three years. I had four operations in a year and spent a lot of time in hospital or recuperating. And then in the autumn this month, two years ago, I had pancreatitis. And it wasn't nice. In fact, you know you hear lots of horror stories about the NHS. I had a good one because I phoned, I had such a bad year, I thought, I can't phone my family again and tell them I'm really ill today. So I tried to get well, but I couldn't. So I phoned 111, is that the number you phone? 10 o'clock at night. And before I put the phone down, the ambulance was outside my home. Isn't that amazing? So thank God. I'm, I'm about to go to Africa tomorrow. And I can assure you, that wouldn't happen there. So we have a lot to thank God for. And while I was in hospital, I was very poorly, and my niece Jess came and read the scriptures to me. Because she's very spiritual like that. Bless her. And she bought a book for me to read when I got better by Jim Chimbala from the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. To my shame, I hadn't heard of him. And it was a book about how when he was a young preacher, he went, he was sent to Brooklyn Tabernacle. And it was such a rough area. And he was scared. And he didn't know what to do. So he decided the best thing to do would be to pray. And that church was built on it's a magnificent place now. And there are some, you read his books, the most incredible miracles that happened on the journey. And still today. And it's called a house of prayer. They pray 24-7. And this isn't a new thing for them. This is going back a while. Now, I tell you that because it's significant to what has now happened to me, although I didn't know at the time. So God spoke to me very powerfully. You know, God moves powerfully all of the time. And we have some incredible times, don't we? But there are some very, 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 very intimate times that you can have with God that, are, that take your breath away. And it was one of those. And I was lying in the hospital bed thinking, why can't anybody else in this ward understand what's going on? God is moving. Wake up, folks. And God spoke to me and he, he told me that this was going to be the start of something new, that I'd been depending on myself because I'm single. 
and I have to pay a mortgage and that he wanted me to give up teaching and I'd, I'd been in and out of teaching sometimes I was full-time in ministry and sometimes I was back in teaching um, and I was back and, and it wasn't going very well for me and I knew that the anointing of God on my life for that was gone but I didn't know what to do because I had a mortgage to pay and God said surely I am your provider and I waited for confirmation like you must do don't do anything rash because God spoken once in fact Tony Wright from Calvary came the next day to visit me and he was the first person to confirm it He'd done exactly the same thing himself when he was ill, stepped out and left his lecturing career trusting God. So I did that and began to see a new anointing on my ministry and, and just trusting God. Eight months ago, I came to preach at Sedgley Community Church. Heard a lot of good things about it for Steve. And he said to me, now, the first teaching point is coming up. He said to me, Shirley, I want you to pray about coming here. You see, I've asked God for you or Maggie Gill. <laughs> That's what he said. Now, here's the first teaching point. I, could, I was very tempted to go home and think, oh, we couldn't get Maggie Gill, so he'll have to make do with me. You, some of you think like that, don't you? Because the way we think, sometimes our default mechanism about the way we think is not godly. You see, it's not godly for me to go home and think, we couldn't get Maggie Gill. That's not godly. That is, that is not a thought from God. That is actually a lie of the devil. Did you know when the devil speaks to you, his words are actually dead? Because this is the only word that's living, God's word. But we give the devil power when we listen to him and we agree with him by declaring it out loud. So I didn't go home and say that, even though I was tempted to. You see, we are, Jesus was tempted. You don't have to give in to it, do you? You can be the better person. Some of you, your default mechanism when things happen in your life are things like this. I might have known that would go wrong. It always comes in threes, doesn't it? Nothing good ever happens to me. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. Do you know, I'm absolutely sure the devil loves it when we say stuff like that because we're giving power and authority to his dead lies. And my first teaching point is, maybe we should change our default to what God says. Now, I know this is similar to what I shared with you last time, but I just want to remind you that when you do that, you give the devil power. So I'm just going to very quickly tell you three things because we could actually spend a whole year talking about what God says because this is God's word. So God says in Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you. They are not plans to harm you. No, they're not plans to harm you. So why would we say then, if it's going to go wrong, it'll go wrong for me? That's not God, is it? I have plans to bless you and give you a hope and a future, bracket, apart from the few that are sitting over here. It's not true, is it? For all of us. God, folks, it's time we started believing and declaring what God says. He says, I love this one, I use it often in Isaiah 54, which at the moment is a very special chapter of, of Isaiah for me. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Do you know that? No weapon. John, no weapon formed against you will prosper. So it doesn't matter what people do to you because it cannot prosper because you're the Lord's. Romans 8, 28, you all know this one by heart. Um, I'm sure you do. All things... All 
all things, not some things, work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So point number one, let's get our default thinking the way that God feels about us. Agree with him. Use the power of your tongue to agree with God. So I didn't entertain those thoughts. And we, we talk to each other, Steve and I. We do talk. We talk quite a lot now. And um, we decided we would pray. That's my second teaching point. Do you know, sometimes I think we really need each other. The Bible says that's true, doesn't it? But sometimes the first thing we ever do is just run to each other for advice instead of running to Jesus. And that's part, that's the reason I believe why some of us go around the mountain too much. Because we're just running, please, John, encourage me. Tell me it's going to be all right. And actually, what we need to do is run to Jesus. God moves when we pray. And there's a possibility tonight, I feel, that for some of us here, God wants to know us a bit better through, let's call it prayer, shall we? God wants to know us a bit, God wants to know you and me a little bit better. One of the things that excites me about Sedgley is the emphasis on prayer. I used to be, at, in Africa, I mean, I'll be up very, very early every morning. But I, when I was in Amblecote years ago leading worship, we were, every Wednesday we were at a prayer meeting, six o'clock in the morning. I'll say seven, Steve, otherwise he'd be calling us in earlier. And um, <laughs> bless him. He's here, he's here earlier than we are. And I haven't done that for years in this country. And now I'm having to get out of bed on a Wednesday morning early. It's putting me out. It's putting me out. And I love it. I love that it's putting me out. Folks, if you want to know God, God better, it's going to put you out. You're going to have to do something about it. It's not comfortable. It's inconvenient to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, Steve. But I love it. God wants to know us better. In Acts chapter 16, let me read to you just a few verses from this story. You, you'll know it very well. Paul and Silas had been preaching and they'd come up against lots of opposition. In fact, they were persecuted, they were insulted, they were stoned, and eventually they were thrown in prison for serving Jesus. Now, you and I might be tempted to say, and I've, I've counseled many a Christian, and I try to be sympathetic, who says, why has this happened to me? What have I ever done to deserve this? Folk, it's the, it's the wrong question. It really is. This is what it says. So they were in the inner cell. Their feet were fastened in stocks. They hadn't just had, you know, um, I don't know, somebody hadn't just bumped into the back of the car or this was really major stuff. And they said about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. You see, the prayer was, it was intricately wrapped up in praise as well. They weren't saying, oh God, why has this happened to me? And it goes on to say, and the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison was shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody in chains came loose. The jailer woke up. And we know what happens, don't we? His whole household gets saved. And God does an incredible miracle through prayer and through praise. There's something going on in this, in this house, you know. The, and word is getting around to other churches that God is moving in Sedgley. And you know part of the reason 
is because we're, we're becoming increasingly a praying people. Because God answers prayer. And I just want to encourage you this evening. When you're tempted to see your situation and, and be a little bit... I, understand, I mean, you know, bad things happen to me too. Be a little sad about it. Pray about it. Pray about it even before you come and talk to Steve about it. And let God do miracles. We're all tempted. You see, we've got to change our default setting once again from living by our feelings to living by faith. We live by faith, don't we? This is not... It may be there's somebody in tonight and you don't yet know Jesus. I have to give you, make it clear to you, this is, if you become a Christian, it's not about feelings anymore. Although we sometimes have nice feelings, which is brilliant because we like them, don't we? It's actually essentially a life of faith. So you start trusting God when you do not understand what's happening. You trust God. Hebrews 11, verse 8 says, Abraham followed God even when he didn't know where he was going. Sometimes we think of Abraham as always having a very clear picture. But actually, Hebrews tells us there were moments when, a Hebrew, um, when he didn't know what he was doing, but he trusted God anyway. You know, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I'll let you into a, a secret. You probably don't want to know this. When I was a teenager, I didn't live around here. I lived in Rugby in Warwickshire. And we had a good news crusade. And Dave Pope came down with his team. And I, I thought he was lovely. I sat on the front row every day. And actually, after the crusade, I actually sent him a perfumed letter. <laughs> I've changed. Praise the Lord. But in, I, I got his autograph like you do. Isn't that bad, eh? I was 13, and I got his autograph, and he wrote this verse that is very special to many of us. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. He will make your path straight. For some of us here this evening, God would bring a new challenge and he would say, next time something happens that's really tough, I want you to choose trust. I want you to trust me and not lean on your own understanding, but to utterly trust me and see what I will do. I believe that's a word for somebody here this evening. Let's trust God. Prayer, a little reminder, is not about a shopping list, although we do pray for people. It's not about even getting direction, although we do pray for direction, as we did in my two-year story. It's actually, essentially, about knowing him better. When we meet on a Wednesday morning, please come and join us if you can, even just for 20 minutes. Actually, what happens there, we pray for lots of people. But essentially, we get to know him better. And that's what he wants with you. He wants to know you better. He wants you to pray about everything. And Steve and I began to have pities about me coming. One of my favorite verses is in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, where it says, Have no anxiety about anything. But with prayer and praise and petition, present your requests to God and the peace of God will fill your heart and also your mind because the battle is really up there, isn't it? I challenge you, the next time you're tempted to be anxious, you've got to pray about it and praise God, just like Paul and Silas did, and let God's peace come and invade you. We are short of peace in our world today, aren't we? Depression, anxiety, fear seem to have overwhelmed our society. 
and Jesus is the answer. And we need to lead in this. We need to be an example to the people of God that we can have peace when things are difficult for us. Even yesterday, you know, when I could... I, I, I um, uninstalled AVG and it just took everything off my computer, the internet. And my initial reaction was, how am I going to pr print my boarding pass? How am I going to finish printing my sermons? And the temptation was to become anxious. So then it was my responsibility to just pray about it. And my brother fixed it today. Because God is good. And he wants to do good things for us. It's practical. Very quickly then, so we began to pray about me coming here. And I began to hear from God's word. Somebody who didn't know what we were praying about gave me some scriptures from Isaiah 54. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your curtains wide. And it went on to talk about just stepping out in God. The word of God leads us to an encounter with the word of God, Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. So this word leads us to an encounter with him. It's not just a clinical reading so that if we had time, I could sing you the books of the Bible, you see, because I learnt them in Sunday school. And that's all good. But actually, this is about us encountering Jesus. I would challenge you. It's part of the armour of God, you know, it's another thing I love about this place, that we Bible study together. We need to know, I am what I am today because of years of sitting in Bible study week in and week out when I was a kid. The shoes, I'll mention just two things about the armor of God, which is in um, Ephesians 6. Thank you. It's useful, isn't it? The shoes, the gospel of peace, can't remember which preacher it was. I was listening to someone earlier in the week. Um, it was either Mike Bickle or Bill Johnson. And he was talking about the shoes, and I've never, know, I've never heard this before, that they had spikes on the bottom so that you could dig in and stand firm. The Word of God helps you to stand firm. And then he talked about the sword of the Spirit. It was just a little short sword. Because it meant that having a little short sword, when they were injured, so, I don't know, say some, a bit of shrapnel got in there, they could dig it out with their short sword. Isn't that amazing that the Word of God enables you to heal yourself? The Word of God heals you. So you take your little short sword, which is the Word of God, and when you're injured, you let the Word of God heal you. Isn't that exciting? So you take the scriptures that are applicable to your wound and you apply them and you're healed. Oh, I love that. Use the word of God when you're injured instead of being so dependent upon other people picking you up all the time. So the teaching point is let the word of God lead you to an encounter with the word of God, stand firm, speak the truth, know the word which gives you healing, brings you healing. So God became, it became clear that I was meant to be here with you working alongside Steve through prayer, through the word of God, through counsel, through the circumstances just coming together. And I believe tonight as we conclude that just maybe God wants to challenge you I'm going to go through those teaching points one more time and then I have one last thing to say. God wants us to stop agreeing with what the devil's telling us and start agreeing with what God's telling us. So if tonight you feel, you know that pull of the Holy Spirit, you know I do that. I say those stupid things that actually are endorsing the lies of the devil. God will never do anything to harm you. Everything he allows in your life is so that you will be better. So Emily's been through a, a really tough time. But it didn't surprise God. He is going to use it to make her a phenomenal woman of God. The devil's a liar and a thief, but God is good. So maybe you need to make a stand tonight and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to discipline myself. 
and cut some of that stuff out and change my default to speak the truth. Maybe God wants to take you a bit deeper in prayer. Puts you out, doesn't it? Wouldn't it be lovely? I, I could write diet books till the cows come home. It's doing it, isn't it? Wouldn't it be lovely if you could have like one day on the diet and all the weight was gone? Wouldn't that be nice? But you know, it's like that with us and God. If you really want more of God, it will cost you something. And you can't just do it once and expect everything to be, expect to be an amazingly anointed person. Number three, remember to walk in faith and not by your feelings. Number four, let the word of God lead you to an encounter with the word of God. You want to know Jesus better? Who is the word of God? Maybe tonight's the time for you to say, you know, I'm going to step up. I'm going to make an effort to spend a little bit of time every day in God's word. And the last thing is this. Two years later, after me reading Jim Chimbala, I decided that God was calling me to Sedgley Community Church. What was the book called? The House of Prayer. Where am I? The House of Prayer. I had no idea. And I want to tell you this. God is working in ways you cannot see. You think God's doing nothing. I have people come up to me today in church going, oh, I'm so jealous of what God's doing in your life. But you see, God's working in ways you cannot see. And all that two years, God was working and working to bring me here to the house of prayer. In Deuteronomy, this is where I really will finish. The people of Israel have been walking around the mountain for 40 years can feel like that, can't it? And it says in chapter 2, and I'm going to read two verses in Deuteronomy chapter 2. We turned back and set out toward the desert along the route of the Red Sea, as the Lord had directed me. For a long time we made our way around the hill country of Seir. Then the Lord said to me, you have made your way around the hill country long enough. Now turn north. There comes a time you have to make a decision. I've gone around this mountain long enough. And some things only you can do something about. You have to decide to change your default about the way you think and speak. You have to decide you're going to get on your knees and seek the Lord. You have to decide you're going to get in his word. You're going to live by faith and not by feelings. Because he wants to make your path straight. And I believe that's a word for some people here tonight. It's time for you to stop going round the same old mountain and step up with him because he has good plans for you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a good God. And Lord, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters here. I thank you for their faithfulness I thank you for what you're doing for them as individuals. I thank you that you're working in ways they cannot see. And Lord, out of the stuff they're going through right now, you are just about to bring out something wonderful. So God, tonight we choose to trust you. For some of us who've, who've lived by our feelings for a long time, we've gone around the mountain of, this is how I feel. Lord, we're turning north. And we're going to start trusting you when we don't feel like it. For some of us, Lord, we want to make a, a step up in our prayer lives, in our, in our reading lives of your precious, living, powerful word, the word of God. We ask you to help us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Because, Lord, we know this church has an anointing on it and something incredible is happening here. And we want to be there with it, Lord. So we choose life and we choose Jesus and we choose, Lord, to live for you. 
I just ask you to bless my brothers and sisters. Bless them abundantly. Help them, God, to live by faith tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.